Well, guys, uh, we want to return to 1 Thessalonians. I've been preaching through this little epistle, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 13. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a pastor's prayer from the Apostle Paul. Uh, he wrote that. He is a model pastor. Uh, Thessal Thessalonian church is a model church. It's the kind of church that every church should be like. We've talked about that before. Of course, Apostle Paul is a model pastor. Every pastor should want to try to be like him. And Paul is doing what all pastors should do here in these verses, and that is pray for God's people, the, the people that God has given him to shepherd. Uh, Peter said this in Acts chapter 6. You remember when uh, the church, the early church had just started, and the church had to select some godly leaders to help out the apostles who were acting as the, the first pastors of that day, and and things were getting out of hand. There was The church was growing so quickly. And they needed some help in caring for the people. And Peter, he said this. He said in, in chapter 6, verse 4 of Acts, devote, we need to devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So, so Peter modeled what Paul practiced. And that is, is that pastors are to pray for God's people. And that's what Paul did. That's what he's doing in these verses that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, a matter of fact, most of the prayers that are written in the New Testament that are recorded for us were prayed by the Apostle Paul. So he's writing a letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he writes out the prayers that he has for them. And again, it gives us a model for how pastors ought to pray. Um, and... Paul, there's recorded prayers for him in Romans and 1 and 2 Corinthians and, and Ephesians and Colossians and 2 Thessalonians and Philemon. And then here in 1 Thessalonians, we have this recorded prayer. So let's look at it. In 1 Thessalonians 3, he starts out, he says, as we night and day keep praying. And what he's, what he's saying is, is that this is a continual thing that we do. Charles Spurgeon said that he's not always like in the act of praying, but he's always in the spirit of prayer. And he says this, as we night and day keep praying more earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. So that is what the man of God cares about. He tells us there, your faith. That's what Paul cared about, was the faith of the people in that church. In other words, he's saying that I want you to have unwavering belief in God. That's what a pastor cares about. He don't really care about a lot of other things that's going on in the world. But he does care about your unwavering belief in God. He also cares about the fact that you have complete devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's part of your faith is that you have complete devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. He also is concerned with your steadfast obedience to the Word of God. That's what the pastor is, that's what every pastor that models their life after the Apostle Paul, those are the things that he cares about. And he says here, he says that we may complete what is lacking in your faith. We want to complete what's lacking in your faith. Now, when you read that, at first you might think that uh, that's a criticism, like they're lacking something. But that's not a criticism. Uh, Paul's not criticizing them. This is, again, this was a great church. This church was a wonderful church. But Paul is just simply stating that with all Christians, all of us, there is always something lacking in our Christian life, we all can grow spiritually, right? We, we, none of us are perfect. So that's what Paul said. I want to come there and, and help you in, complete whatever is lacking. I want to help you grow in your faith. And, and guys, some of you have been Christians for a long time. You know that Christianity is, spiritual growth is progressive. It's progressive. It, you don't just wake up one day and bam, you're a great mature Christian and you got it all together. 
No, that hasn't happened to anybody. Now, there's some people who think it happened to them. You want to stay away from those people. They're self-righteous. They're always telling you uh, what to do and things like that. But Christianity is progressive. We all lack in some areas. And you know what that, you know what that means, don't you? The pastor's uh, it's job security for the pastor. <laughs> you know, uh, a pastor could preach for years and years and years, and, and still there's people lacking in their faith including himself. So that's what he means there. Then he says in verse 11, he, he starts the prayer. He said, he's, I, I'm praying for you, and I want to come see you because of what's lacking in your faith. And then he starts the prayer, and let me read it what he says. In verse 11, he says, Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. So he's praying. He says, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you. So that, now this is why he's praying. This is what he wants to happen. So that he, this is God, may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Now, this is a prayer of a man of God. Not everybody prays like this, actually. But this is the prayer of the Apostle Paul, who is a man of God. And there are two real clear points from this passage, and they're very simple points, but they're important because they give us instructions on how to pray, uh, what to pray, and insights into the heart of this man, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, uh, and all in spirit, spirit in, uh, inspired. So there's two points. Let me give those to you. First of all, in, this, in these verses, we see who he prayed to. In other words, who he directed his prayers to. That's important. It's simple. But it is extremely important. And also what he prayed for. In other words, what made the Apostle Paul's prayer list? It's very unlike most of our prayer list. So first of all, who he prayed to. It says here, now may our God. So, so by the way, when he says now may our, that word may, it's... it's um, I believe it's the subjunctive tense, and it's a wish prayer. He, he says, now, so this is, this is Paul's longing of his heart. It's what Paul wants to happen for them. He says, now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. So Paul understood that God can do things that we can't do. That's the, that's the point here. He's praying. Why? Because there's certain things he can't do. Paul can't. Uh, he had already tried to get back to the Thessalonians, but uh, you remember uh, back in chapter 2, we find out that Satan hindered him and stopped Paul from getting there. So Paul understood that spiritual work requires spiritual power. So where do you go to for spiritual power? You go to God in prayer. And because there's many things that we cannot do, but, there's, but God, there's nothing God can't do. Luke 18 says, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. So he prays, and he says, may God our, our Father, the God and Father himself. So Paul uses this term Father. The reason why he uses the term Father is because he wants to emphasize the relationship that he had with God. And, and all believers have the same relationship with God that Paul did. And that is, it's an intimate relationship. God is not some distant force that is uninterested in what's going on in the details of your life. That is not the God of the Bible. God is, is a father figure. He is um, very caring, very compassionate. And very interested in what is going on in your life. 
Uh, I know some people, their fathers aren't that way. Well, you can't get your view of God the Father from a father that's not doing what he's supposed to do. And I want to encourage you not to do that. God always does what he's supposed to do. And Paul, so he prays to God, the Father himself, and then he also prays to Jesus, our Lord. This is, this is important. Uh, this is Paul reminding the reader that it's not just God who rules the world, it's also Jesus. He rules the, the universe as well. Now, the reason why this is important is if you go back 2,000 years ago, uh, even within people who believed in God, this was a whole new concept that Jesus is equal to God, that he is the Lord, that he is the sovereign over the universe. So Paul is establishing this. He is letting us know that, look, you can, we can pray to either God the Father or Jesus our Lord for help. You know, I know some people ask me sometimes, who can I pray to? God. Well, who is God? Well, God is the Father, He is the Son, and He's the Holy Spirit. So you pray to God. So don't get all, you know, making these things a big deal when it comes to who you're praying to. When Peter was getting ready to drown, he didn't ask the question, you know, oh, who's going to help me now? He just said, Lord, save me. Right? And that's what you do. You can pray to God. You can pray to God the Father. You can pray to God the Son. You can pray to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they're all God. And they're equal. And this is important. This is important. And why is it so important? Here's why. Because most religious people in the world do not follow the Bible when it comes to prayer. And what I mean by that is most people in the world, most of the people, and the relig I'm talking about the religious people. They're not praying to God and Jesus. They're not praying to the God of the Bible. They're not praying to the Lord Jesus Christ that is described to us in the Word of God. There are... One point, you know, apart from the 1.2 billion people who are irreligious, in other words, they don't pray to anybody. These are the people who say to you, hey, I'm sending positive thoughts. That's those people. I, and I just, you know, thank you for that, but your positive th thoughts are not going to do me one bit of good. Okay? Thank, I'd rather you give me positive than negative, I guess. But that's 1.2 billion irreligious people. But besides those people, there's the 1.9 million mu billion buzz. Mu <laughs> what was I about to say? 1.9 billion Muslims? Um, 1.9 billion Muslims. Uh, they don't pray to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the God they do pray to is a, is a God they call Allah. It's really just a, the same word for God for them. But it's not the God of the Bible. Their God is a God of judgment. And you've got to submit to him or you're going to get it. There's no love. It's not the God of the Bible. It's the God of the Koran, which is not a God at all. So, but that's who they are praying to. They're pr so we've got 1.9 billion Muslims praying to a false god. And they also pray to angels. I didn't know this, but, you know, when they go and they bow down, you know, five times a day toward Mecca and all that stuff. And if they don't do that, they're going to go to hell. But that's what they do. And then I heard that when they get to the end of their prayer, they look to the right, and there's some imaginary, invisible angel there that they ask for some kind of blessing to. And then there's 900 million Hindus who pray to Bhumi uh, Devi. Bhumi Devi, that, this is the, um, in their belief, it's Mother Earth. 
Mother Earth. That's what they, hey, they have a strong belief in Mother Earth. That Mother Earth is the one who created us and takes care of us and all of us come from Mother Earth. Then there's the 535 million Buddhists who sit in front of Buddha and other statues too and they meditate. They, you know, Buddhists don't even pray, actually. They just, I guess they just sit there and think within their own self in the, in the great force of the, uh, the cosmos of the world. But they don't actually pray to a god. But what they're trying to do while they're meditating is they're trying in their own power, in their own strength, in their own ability, they're trying to seek enlightenment, hoping to one day uh, achieve nirvana. Now, then, besides all of that, all those people, and this is billions we've already talked about, uh, there's 1.3 billion Catholics who pray. Now, they do pray to God, the Father, and they do pray to Jesus Christ. But they also pray to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and they pray to dead saints, dead saints. And they do all of this. All of this is done by all of these false religions. All of these, these religious people who would call themselves, you know, yeah, I'm a religious person. I'm good with God. I believe. They do all of this stuff where these things are not taught in the word of God, which is the authority. We're never told to pray to a mother. Mother Earth, Mother Mary, we're, that's never mentioned in Scripture, not once, not even hinted to. Um, we're certainly not instructed to pray to angels or dead saints. I mean, why would you pray to a dead guy? I, 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 that's confusing to me. So if I felt walked up and saw a guy laying on the ground dead, would I ask him to do something for me? No. And they can't do anything for you. But these people have got hooked up in the things that they don't even know who to pray for or to. They don't know who to pray to. Uh, Jesus tells us who to pray to in Matthew 6, verse 9. It says, pray then in this way. What does he say? Our Father, not our Mother. But Jesus is saying, pray, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then he, he asks our Father to do things for him because God can do things for you that you can't do for yourself. So he says, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, or give us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So Paul prays to God the Father, and he prays to the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 14, Jesus says this, Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. You know, that's a wonderful promise, by the way. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. So that the Father, why does God answer our prayers? Why does, why does Jesus answer your prayers? He tells us right here. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now the word I name, there's a lot of confusion for that. When Jesus says that if you ask anything in my name, that does not mean that you say, Jesus, I want a Lexus. In Jesus' name I pray, and then you're, gonna, you're supposed to get the Lexus. That's not what that means. Now, it does if you're in a charismatic church. They might say that to you, but it doesn't really mean that. What it means is, is that when you pray according to the will of Jesus, when you pray, when you pray and you ask for things that Jesus wants you to have anyway, that's what it means. You pray in his will. You're praying in his authority. You're asking for things that Jesus cares about. He says, I'm going to give that to you. Now, this is the pastor's prayer, and it's a model for us. 
It's a model for us. And yet so many people, and I just went by through billions and billions of people that I just went through, right? And they're all religious. And they're, none of them are praying properly. None of them. They don't even know who to pray to. And I want to say this to you. You can't be saved if you don't know who to pray to. Because you're only getting forgiveness through God and his son Jesus Christ. That's the only way to get forgiveness. You're not getting it anywhere else. You're not going to get salvation. You're not going to be saved. You're not going to be forgiven of your sins unless you know who to pray to. If you're praying to the wrong people, you're going to die in your sins. And that's why this is so important that you need to know who to pray to. Secondly, you got to know what to pray for. And this is what the apostle prayed for, uh, the apostle Paul prayed for. He says, now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. So he's wanting that. That's what he's praying for. And, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another. He's praying for that. And for all people, he's praying for that. So that we, just as we also do for you. Now, that he's not praying there. He's basically making a statement. We have loved you, and you know we have. So then, in verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness. Now, basically, he's talking about spiritual maturity. To be without blame in holiness is, is just a definition of being spiritually mature. So to be without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So he's saying, I want you to be spiritually mature when Jesus comes back. Wouldn't you hate it to be doing something you shouldn't be doing as a Christian and then Jesus comes back while you're doing it? Wouldn't that be a bummer? It, yeah, and I've had people come to me and tell me that, you know, man, I was doing something and, and I, it hit my mind. What if Jesus came back right now? Paul says, I want you to be spiritually mature when that happens. So he prays for two things. There's two things he prays for. He prays to God the Father himself and Jesus Christ our Lord. They're equal. But then he prays for two things here. And, there, and you, might, you might find these a little interesting. First of all, he prays for him to return to them. That's what Paul wants to do. He says, I want to come back to you. And then for them to increase in love. Now may the God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way back to you. So he's saying, direct our way back to you that I want to get back to you. Why? Why does Paul want to get back to them? He said, well, we already talked about that in verse 10, to complete what is lacking in your faith. And see, that's what pastors do. That's what they want to do. That's, they get up in the morning thinking about that. They go to bed at night thinking about all through the day. They're thinking about how to grow people spiritually, how to complete what is lacking in their faith. This is the work of the pastor, the spiritual growth of believers, to teach them God's word and, and to get them ready for ministry. Guys, immature people don't serve. Have you noticed that? Spiritually immature people, they don't serve. You can't even find them when there's something to do for God. So Paul even though this church is a great church, and it is a great church, uh, he, he says they can still improve in the ministry. And who's supposed to help them do that? The pastor. The pastor. And this is what Ephesians 4.11 says. He gave, <clears throat> he's talking about he, God did. God gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers Four, why did he give all these offices? There's four separate offices. Apostles and prophets, we believe they're, they were temporary offices that are gone now, that the word of God is complete. We have the word of God completed. They did their job. 
apostles were the foundation of the early church. The prophets put forth the word of God to us before it was written. Now it's written and complete. We don't need those offices anymore. We do need evangelists, which are basically missionaries who go out and win people to Christ all over the world. And then we need pastors and teachers, which is the same office in one person because they're the ones that teach in the church. In the church. And here's why you need them. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So, so Paul's saying, Lord, please direct me back to them. I want to go back to them. I want to teach them. I want to equip them. I want to establish their hearts blame, without blame and holiness. I want to help them become spiritually mature before God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So he said, that this is what he's praying for. I, I want to get to them. I want to teach them. I want to help them become spiritually mature. The second thing that he prayed for, it says here, and, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound. So he's praying for them to increase in love. We talked about that, right? Look, and, and that the, the Lord may cause you to increase and abound in money. Doesn't say that, does it? Health. Doesn't say that either. Why not? Business success doesn't say that either. See, that's not what Paul prayed for. And if there was ever a time in the world that he would pray for something like that, if that's really what God wanted for us, this is a good time for him to mention that. But that is so far from what really God wants for his people. Money, health, perfect health. I mean, it's just ridiculous to think that the God wants everybody, it is his will for everybody to be rich, for everybody to be perfectly healthy, forever, matter of fact, forever. That, you know, it's like, you know, you're 75, 80 years old and, and you're not supposed to get sick? I mean, what planet do those people live on? So Paul is praying what really should be prayed for. Not money, not health. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you can't pray for God to help you financially and pay your bills. And I'm certainly not pray, saying that we should not pray for the health and the healing and the well-being of people. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying that if you have a business that you don't pray that God will help you be successful. There's there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. But those aren't the main things that a pastor prays for. That's not on his prayer list as much as it might be on yours. <clears throat> and this is what Paul is saying here. He says here that the Lord may cause you to increase and abound in love. For one another. Now guys, we, all, we already understand increase and abound. We already understand that they are a loving church. We've already learned that, right? They, they are a loving church. In 1 Thessalonians 1.3, I mean the third verse of this book, Paul is saying it, and commending them for your work of faith and labor of love. So this is already a loving church. They had agape, they had love. They had it already and it was agape love. That's the Greek word here that's used. This is the most noble, generous, and selfless love. This is the highest form of love, agape love. It's it's, it, it's concern for the well-being of others more than your own self. That's what agape love is. See, all those other prayer requests, who do they focus on? 
money, health, wealth, success. What, who do they focus on? On you. It's exactly the opposite kind of love that God wants for us to have. It's exactly the opposite. He wants us to kind of have, have the kind of love that is more concerned with other people than for ourselves. That's what he's saying here. Uh, the Thessalonians already had labored for God. They already had done that. They actually already had agape love. Um, they had already shown that and displayed that. And here Paul, what's Paul praying? Okay, so we already have it. We already have a copy. I'm already concerned for other people. And then Paul comes, he says, may the Lord cause you to increase. In other words, to have more, uh, to, to do it more, to be more loving is what he's talking about here. And I pray that, that it may abound in love, that you abound. So first of all, you increase in love so you can have more love than you already have and then abound in love. And abound means that you have more than you need. That means it's overflowing. It means that when you are around that church, everybody senses that there is an overabundance of love within that group. And you can tell it. It's more than that is needed. See, that's the kind of love that God gives to you and me. More than, we are sinners. We deserve to go to hell. God's grace abounds toward us. He lavishes, lavishes us with love. Why? It takes that much to save us. It takes a lot of love to save you and me. And I think it takes a lot of love for a church to be what God wants it to be also. And this is what Paul is praying for. He's praying that they love one another. Abundance love, have more love than needed. And he does say it's for one another. Do you see that? For one another. In other words, the family, the Christians, the people that are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have love for one another. And by the way, there's like, if you go through the whole scripture, there's like 20 one another's that we're supposed to do for one another, pray for one another, encourage one another have compassion to one another, forgive one another. It just goes on and on and on of all the things that we're supposed to do for one another. And he says here we are to pray for one another or to love one another. And Love is the highest spiritual virtue. Would you agree with that? Now, how do you know that you're growing spiritually? How do you know that? Well, you're loving more. That's how you know it. It's not a mystery whether you're growing spiritually. There's, there's evidence of spiritual growth. It, it's that you are loving more. That was a very loving thing to say, by the way. Your loving is increasing. You, you, it's not the same as it was. So you can't be a loving person the first 10 years of your Christianity and be the exact same amount of love the second 10 years of your Christianity, and then you're, now you're a Christian for 30 years, and you love exactly the same amount as you did back then. What is that? That's not growth. So how do you know that you're actually growing spiritually, maturing spiritually? It's because your love is increasing, and we all know that love is a verb, right? Love is not just some abstract feeling that you have in your heart. For people. Love is a verb. Love is an action word. So you know that you're loving more when you're what? When you're serving more. That's how you know. You start looking at your schedule and you say, you know what? Ten years ago I wouldn't have done that. Now I'm doing this. Why? You're, you've grown spiritually. You're loving more so you're serving more. You're also less concerned for yourself and more concerned for others. You should ask yourself these questions. How often do I make all my decisions based on me? What's good for me? 
Or do I make my decisions based on what's good for the other people that are around me? And this is spiritual growth. This is what Paul is praying for. He wants their love to increase and abound. So are you loving more? You know, you know you're loving more when you spend more of your time and your energy and your wealth on other people than you did before. That's how you know you're loving more. I mean, if you're still giving one hour a week of your two hours a week of your time to the service of the Lord, and you did that 10 years ago, you've made no increase. If you're still giving the same amount of money away to good causes as you did before, then your love has not increased. Paul says this, be devoted to one another. In, in Romans 12, this is one of the, the one another's. He says, be devoted. That's a pretty strong word, isn't it? I'm to be devoted to you? Isn't it nice to have somebody devoted to you? Isn't that nice thing? I, I love it. I have, I have people that are devoted to me, and I can sense it. I can tell it. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing in a Christian family to have that. The, he tells it, it's a command. Be devoted to one another in what? In brotherly agape love. Brotherly love. Give, and then he defines it. He says, give preference to one another in honor. And honor just means, that's the Greek word to me, and it means value. I give preference to you because I value you. That's why I do it. And the opposite is the same. I don't give preference to you because what? You don't mean anything to me. And this is, this is what Paul is praying for. Do you see how important this is? This is more important than praying for a little money. This is more important than praying for physical health. This is more important than praying that your business is successful. This is talking about the church, spiritual maturity. This is talking about bringing honor to God. So when the whole church is, more, is loving more, more gets done for the glory of God. The less we love, the less we do. The more we love, the more is happening. There's more action. Love is a verb. It's an action word. So there's a tremendous amount of action going on for other people by me when love grows and increases. When love doesn't grow, you're home watching television. You're taking another vacation. You're... Uh, going somewhere that has fun for you, that's when love doesn't grow. But when the love does grow, a lot more work is going on for other people, for the glory of God. 1 Thessalonians 3.12, he says, May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another. So Paul is praying that God causes this. God causes this kind of growth because he understands that all spiritual work is a work of God, right? We, there are certain things that we can't do. Only God can cause that in the heart of a believer. Only God can make you increase in your love and abound in love. Now, if you're not increasing in love, generous and selfless love, for one another. There's no increase. If you can't look back over time and say, yeah, I've made some progress, then you ought to be concerned about that. That is a, that is a spiritual problem that you have. And there should be some, you should make note of that. <laughs> note, I'm not, I'm not growing in my love. He says here, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people just as 
we also do for you. He says, for all people. So he also is telling us that we, this is a reference to, I believe, unbelievers, the rest of the world. So we are to love our church, and I believe first, that's priority, especially those who are of the household of faith. The Bible tells us that. We, we, don't, we don't, you know, charity starts at home, right? We all know that. We don't go out and give a $500 to some stranger when there's somebody in our church that needs it. We don't do that. We give $500 to a stranger after we've taken care of our church family. But he says here, and we do need to do both. But he says love for all people. Now this is a reference to unbelievers. So Paul is praying that the Thessalonians have agape love um, for all people. And can I tell you what the most loving thing is that you can do for an unbeliever? Where's the... Can I tell you the most loving thing you can do for an unbeliever? Put that up, Linda. Is that Linda up there? Tell them the truth. That's the most loving thing that you can do for an unbeliever. Now, that obviously includes a lot of things. But it's the most loving thing that you can do. Guys, you could... You tell them the good news that Jesus Christ saves repentant sinners. So you tell them the good news that you can be saved. But you also need to tell them the bad news. And the bad news is that unrepentant sinners are eternally punished. Now that's what so many people leave out. And that's what the Apostle Paul did to the Thessalonians. When he went into the town, he told them all of it. He told them the good news. He told them the bad news. And that is the only way. That God, you, a person has to hear it all. They have to hear the good news, the bad news. They have to hear that God saves repentant sinners who believe in Jesus. And he also punishes unrepentant sinners who refuse to believe in Jesus. He, you have to tell them all that. And that's the only way that, as Paul said here, may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints, you, 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 you can't only just tell them the good news. You can't be without blame in holiness before God. If all you're doing is telling them, a person, the good news, you know, oh, God loves you, and that's it. They have to hear it all. You can't just say God loves you. You can't just say God forgives you. That's just part of the truth. So telling an unbeliever just the good news is not loving them. They need to know it all. I know people, um, a preacher recently that, uh, and it's a sad thing, he's a great, Wonderful preacher his whole life. His whole life. Wonderful, wonderful preacher. But what happens is, is uh, as preachers get older, they get soft. They get too soft. Is what I say. It's too soft. And they just start loving everybody and mercy and all that stuff. And those are 100% things that need to be done. But you can't... There's, a, there's another aspect of God which is his rebuking and his his confronting and his discipline and isn't there in the Bible talk about that so this preacher I'm not going to mention his name out of respect for him because he is a very famous guy but he went he was asked to go to a homosexual wedding where two I, I don't know if it was men or women get married and he went to it, and, um, and he said, it's because I want to show love and compassion and possibly have an opportunity to witness to them. And what really is happening when a man of God does that is he's putting his 
approval on it. He's acknowledging that this is a wedding. And he should not have went. You know, you don't, you don't go somewhere that is clearly an abomination to God. Abomination. A perverted act before God. And you go and put your blessings on that event. You shouldn't do that. And it's hurt his ministry tremendously. The, the best thing, the most loving thing he could have done for those two people is said, what you're doing is a sin. And you need to stop doing it. And matter of fact, if you do it, you're going to feel the wrath of God on your eternal soul forever. You need to repent. That's what the most loving thing could have been said to those people. But he didn't do it. He didn't do that. So I just want you to know that, you know, confronting people with their sin, and of course you should do that with a kindness and a, and a graciousness when you're doing it, but just letting people do whatever they want to do and patting them on the back and pretending like you're being loving, you're not being loving when you do that. You're actually, as um, I think the proverb says, uh, a parent that doesn't spank his child hates their child. You know, you have to discipline your kids. And God doesn't want us to just let people do whatever they want to do. You got to tell them the truth. Look what 1 Corinthians 6 says, and I'll be done in a few minutes. All right? I love y'all, so I'm going to try to stop soon. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? In other words, you're not going to go to heaven. Do not be deceived. This is what the problem is. Many people are deceived. Neither fornicators, it's people who are having sex outside of wedlock, nor idolaters, people who, you know, have statues all around their house, nor adulterers. You know, if you're married, you're only supposed to have sex with your spouse. Did y'all know that? Did y'all know that? Yeah, you can't go around just doing whatever you want to do, nor effeminate. So now he's getting into this idea of homosexuality, transgenderism, all this stuff. By the way, there is no such thing as transgender. There's no body, it's, you know, either you're a man or you're a woman, period. That's it. Uh, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. You know, I know people who think that you can be a homosexual and go to church and go to heaven, and I'm telling you, you can't. You're not going to go to heaven if you're a practicing homosexual. You're not going to go. If you say that this is okay for me to do it, do it, and God loves me just the way I am, and I can love whoever I want to love. You are, you are in direct rebellion to the Word of God. So you're, you're not a Christian. You're not going to go to heaven. And all homosexuals, all lesbians need to be told that in the proper way, in the proper timing. You know, I'm not saying just run out and tell them today, you know, you might... <laughs> It has to be at the right time and the right way, but they need to be told that. He says, nor thieves, so people who are thieves, nor covetous. You see, you know, guys, there's so many religious people, they're praying and praying for money, money, blessings, financial blessings. Financial. You know why? They're covetous people. It's questionable if they're even a Christian. They're coveted. If somebody, all they want is money all the time, they have a problem. Nor drunkards, people who are drunks, 
And my old pastor used to tell me, you might see a Christian down at the ABC Liquor Lounge for a while, but you won't see them there long. They'll get out eventually. They'll get out. Uh, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then That's the bad news. But here's the good news. Paul says, such were some of you. I mean, I read through this list, and I'm looking out here at you, this group, and I'm thinking, you know, most of you probably were one of these things at one time. Who knows? But you were washed. This is what Jesus does for you. He washes you. But you were sanctified. So he set you apart. He, he took you out of the world. He set you apart over here. And he said, now, now I'm going to use you for me. I'm going I'm to get glory from you. And now you're, you're going to live for me. And I've sanctified you. I've set you apart for the work of holy things. This is what God does for us. We're washed, we're sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Justified means just as if you never sinned, just as if I never sinned, justified. That's what happens. You know, Tom was talking about earlier, we, we are, uh, practically we are sinners, but positionally we are saints. When God looks at us, all he sees is the perfection of, of Jesus Christ. That's all he sees. Isn't that wonderful? That you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Now why, why, so these people changed. Even the Corinthians changed. The Thessalonians changed. All the believers that the Apostle Paul came in contact with and preached to and taught, they, they changed their life. And why did they change? It's because Paul loved them enough to tell them the truth, the whole truth. You're not going to change a sinner if you don't tell them they're sinning. They have to know. They have to know that they're doing the wrong thing and they need to change. And this is why this, this and here he prays. This is what the Apostle Paul prays. And he prays to God, Jesus, and he prays so people's lives would be changed. And that's why he prays. He knows that he can't do it. So he prays to God to do it. I can't, you know, I can't change you. You can't change me. But guess who can change us? God can change us. So, so that's why we need to pray to God for this change. And Paul prayed that they would increase in their love and Love is the highest spiritual virtue and he wants their hearts to be established without blame and holiness. Now guys, when you do that, here's what happens. When, you, when your heart is established without blame and holiness, here's what happens. You start to think better. Your decisions are better. You treat people better. You minister better. You encourage people better. You're a better example to other people. And you tell people the truth. When your heart is established without blame and holiness because your love is increased, you start telling people the truth. And believe me, people's lives will be changed. The beautiful thing is, is that we do all this because we know that one day we are going to stand in front of God and that Jesus Christ is coming back. So we do that. That's what we do. And the Apostle Paul is praying for this church. Would you pray with me? With your heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to ask you, who do you pray to? Does it really do you any good if you're not praying to the God, the creator of the universe that's revealed to us in scripture and to his son Jesus, the Lord, the ruler of the universe and all creation? And what do you pray for? That uh, reveals a lot about your spiritual maturity. 
Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for this passage of Scripture and how it teaches us, helps us know who to pray to and what to pray for, and it, it helps us to get our priorities right before you. And we just thank you for this prayer that the Apostle Paul wrote down under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And we do pray that you would increase the love of this church for one another and that it would abound, our love would abound toward one another. But also to all people. Uh, I just can't think of anything better than this church, the Connecting Church, being known as one of the most loving churches in town. And not loving in a way where we don't tell people the truth, but we still tell the whole truth. But we speak the truth in love. Motivated by love. Because we care about people. And Father, we pray today that if there's anybody here that's never accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day that they receive Him, that they believe in Him, and they receive the free gift of eternal life the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.